Hi, my daughter was CCW safe, and I've been asked to tell my story um, about a shooting I was involved in, which was the later became the creation for CCW safe. Um, I was a police officer in Oklahoma City, uh, started in 1991, went through the academy. I was there until 2001, and then worked from 2001 to 2011 uh, for the ATF out of Dallas, running a uh, violent crimes program. Um, so in 1996, I was on a team called Impact. We were a plainclothes street level team that worked street, street level felonies. Happened to work a lot of uh, narcotics cases but it was a really cool team. We had like eight people. <clears throat> we would work anything if it were robbery or homicide. Robbery had some cases going on uh, that they wanted us to, to do surveillance on or um, homicide or whatever <clears throat> case that was brought to us uh, that was in our division we worked on. Uh, when we weren't doing anything, we would just drive around and look for things. Uh, we were because we were plain clothes and unmarked cars. We would typically drive around and find people that we knew were targets of, of narcotics investigations, practice surveillance on them, and sometimes we'd end up with with good cases just off of traffic stops as we noticed them making stops or whatever. <clears throat> really, uh, probably the funnest time. I had in law enforcement. Um, so that team, we worked our own investigations, we had our own files, we worked our own um, confidential informants, we got our own warrants. Uh, once we got the warrants, we actually hit the house. Um, we were a, kind of a self-sufficient team. <clears throat> we would always have one or two or more uniform guys with us when we when we hit the warrants. And on this one particular day, we had a, we had a informant that was a reliable informant, we had worked for us in the past, got us some really good, good cases. There's one suspect, <clears throat> one individual who had gotten out of prison was a uh, gang member in a white supremacist group, uh, gang, Dylan again, back on the street. She, uh, the confidential informant, informant, told us about this individual, uh, <clears throat> made a buy from the house. And when she came out of the house, um, we did it. We always did a debriefing of, of what happened in the house. Um, the informant stated there was a firearm. Uh, she saw a firearm, he pulled it out, he showed her. Uh, he was bragging about shooting uh, two or three black guys who had, who had come in and tried to do a home invasion. <clears throat> we tried to um, corroborate that through 911 calls, through hospital reports, through CAD, through everything. We couldn't find anything, any evidence of that actually happening. Uh, we kind of thought, well, there's a female informant. He may have been just kind of trying to impress her. Um, but nonetheless, we knew that he had this story in his head. And if we were to kick in the door, then we had a pretty good idea of what might happen. So we pushed that to, at the time, we had a full-time TAC team, or we had a TAC team that would run all the high-risk warrants, <clears throat> if it were a case like this. Um, at that time, we, were, we would train with the TAC team and they would train us in how to do entries because we did, I think in the two years that I was there, we did probably close to 400 warrants. Uh, we were running warrants, uh, we were running a lot of warrants at that time and, and, and they were a lot of uh, immediate entry, no knock, or, or not knock and talk. So after the shooting I was involved in, the teams, there were four teams like that throughout the city in different divisions, and they kind of went to more knock and talk um, warrants rather than immediate entry warrants. <clears throat> but we had trained with the TAC team and they would train us on, on entry tactics and 
most of the warrants that we got were uh, immediate entry, high risk warrants, but this case was one that had a little bit more that we knew there was a really good chance of something happening if we hit that house. <clears throat> and I don't remember exactly what happened, but it got kicked back and they weren't gonna run the warrant. And um, so I looked at my lieutenant and at the time I had five years on and typically when somebody does something for five years, uh, typically that's when they're kind of at the top of their game. They're really considered, I guess, a professional. Um, so my partner and I, we had about the same amount of time in. We went and talked to our lieutenants and I can't remember if something happened to prompt this, but my lieutenant said, we're going to hit this house. And I, so I said, okay. He said, put it on the board. So we put it on the board, which meant we would go out and we would do, uh, we would send another team or, or another uh, two or three officers to go do a drive by on the house and see where, what the structure was like, where the windows, where the doors were, where the pipes were on the roof. So we could kind of develop what we knew about the house inside with what we already had from the CI. So we had a pretty good idea of the layout of the house. And we want that because when we, we hit the house, we wanna know exactly, or as best we can, what we're going into. And so we put it on the board, we got all the team uh, listed out, we got the officers, the uniformed officers to come out. And we had a van, unmarked van, that we would we'd hit the house. and. Typically on the east side of Oklahoma City, whenever you turn that corner, then everybody on that block would be yelling, you know, police, popo, and everybody just start running. Well, this warrant was on the west side. So uh, I remember turning the corner, pulling up to the house, and when we pulled up to the front of the house, uh, the neighbor, there was, there was a couple kids playing out in the front yard. There was some kids out in the front yard, and the the neighbor ran out and grabbed the kids and ran back in the house, um, which was different than what we normally get because we normally get, you know, as soon as we turn the block, they start yelling um, and everybody's running. But I remember when that happened, and that was, uh, I guess, a pretty good foreshadowing of, of what even they knew was probably going to happen at that house. Uh, <clears throat> we exited, went up. Knocked on the door, announced police. We typically wait one to two seconds, slam hits. Um, at the time, I was always number two man in the door. I'm six foot two. Um, my partner at the time, who was always number one man in, he was about five eight. <clears throat> um, and we would, we would run in pairs. So the first two in, then the slam was number three, and then, or, one, two, slam, three, four, five, six, and we typically run in pairs, so whatever room we go into, one and two would take this room, three and four would flood to the next room, five and six flood to the next room. We could clear a house, it was a dynamic entry, we could clear a house <clears throat> extremely fast. Most of the houses we hit were, you know, anywhere between 1,100 square feet to 1,500 square feet, and we would flood that house in seconds. And this house, <clears throat> immediately upon the slam entering and entering into the house, my partner, if he goes, if he directs one way, then I'm gonna direct the other way. And as soon as he went in, I saw him kind of go right, I went left. And as soon as I came in, I saw the suspect laying on the couch. Um, his head was away from me and he started rolling up with a firearm. And it was the firearm, I remember the confidential informant saying that he had this huge gun. And it was a 357 revolver. When he rolled up, it looked like a huge gun. Um, I saw a muzzle flash and I immediately uh, engaged. I thought at the time, that he, I saw the firearm rolling up, 
saw the muzzle flash, I thought he shot my partner because immediately I had, I experienced a tunnel vision that went on right in on his firearm. Um, I experienced a, and we've talked about this before, but uh, the physiological effects that you that you're going to experience if you're involved in any critical incident. Um, but I experienced tunnel vision. I experienced um, auditory exclusion, which I think I remember hearing a couple pops, but never heard the shots until the last shot. <clears throat> um, but I engaged. I also experienced a. Um, definite slowdown in time. Uh, I remember the first shot off as he was, as his hand was coming up, I remember the first shot, um, I remember seeing the impact on the back of his hand. <clears throat> and I was using that, um, I was using that shot for my shot placement of the second, third, and fourth shot just walking him up his arm. And he was laying laying in a way to where the shots were going in the arm, into the body. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I thought my partner had been shot because I saw this muzzle flash. I uh, fired and fired four rounds. At the time, I didn't know. We, I kind of learned this as we were going through the investigation and through the civil lawsuit the expert who came in. Um, and I think Gary had talked earlier about, you know, he didn't know if he, he was talking about his shooting. He didn't know if he was saying these things because of it was something that he experienced or something he was told or something that came out in the investigation. And that's a, kind of the same way my uh, story was trying to piece that together. Even, even now, 20 years later, when I've talked about this multiple times. Um, I fired four shots, stopped, and at that time he had started to withdraw and drop the firearm. I remember the firearm dropped on his kind of his stomach. He reached up, he was trying to get the firearm. Again, he got it. I fired three more shots. And <clears throat> at that time um, he started to curl into a fetal position. I saw um, fo foam from his nose start to come out. Uh, figured that was a lung shot pushing out. And I knew at that point that um, it was pretty much over. So I kept my position. I immediately looked to my right because that's where my partner was thinking that he had been shot. Looked to my right and came back to cover this individual, and when I did, my partner was standing there. He was standing, I could see that he wasn't shot. Uh, what I learned later was when he came in, he came in, went right, I went left. He saw that threat coming up. So he fired one round in a kind of a manner like this, running to his right, and he stole, and he, his firearm stovepipe. So as he was tapping, racking, clearing his, I engaged. By that time, I look at him, come back to the suspect. I, I start tapping on my arm, uh, you know, telling him to get here because this is now gone from a dynamic entry to we're going from a dynamic to a limited entry at that point. At that point, we were locking everything down right there. I tapped on my arm. I said, Mike, come to me. I said, watch your back. And I said, watch your back because I saw a dark hallway behind him. Well, right as I said that, I hear five shots. And uh, the father came out from the back, grabbed my partner around the neck, grabbed his gun hand, and like I said, my partner was 5'8", 150 pounds, and this guy was, I don't know, he was like six foot, 240, 250 pounds starts pulling him back into the hallway. Well, he turns, fires one shot, and I guess by that time, you know, my tunnel vision, I think when I turned to check on my partner, I think that opened up, I think my auditory opened up, and then I heard another shot, and it 
sounded, that one shot sounded as five shots. So we exited the house. Um, we, I remember getting out on the corner. I got another magazine reloaded. I didn't know exactly how many rounds I shot. I do remember ejecting one out on the corner. And I remember telling everybody, lock down the house, lock down the back, lock down the side. I thought at that point we had a full militia in the house because I didn't know what was going on with those last shots. Um, the father came out, <clears throat> walked out, collapsed on the front porch. I could tell that he was uh, not going to make it. Uh, his chest was blown open, came out, collapsed. And I looked at my partner and I said, who is that? And he said, that's who you saw behind me. I was like, I didn't see anybody behind you. I saw a dark hall. I saw a dark space behind you. So at that point, we had to re-enter the house. <clears throat> we had everything locked down. We re-entered the house. My partner and I went through. One suspect was deceased on the on the front porch. One was on the on the uh, couch. We went into the kitchen, and uh, the rest of the team went back, secured the back of the house. And I remember it was like a, it was like a, like a crazy circus house because I remember we're standing there in the kitchen, and we're sitting there and I, you know we're looking at each other and we're like, holy shit, this just happened, and we turn around and there's a converted garage door behind us, so we open that and we go out to clear that, <clears throat> and it had a. I like a wall that went out and then around the corner and there was a bed. So we kind of cleared what we could and we had to go around this wall to clear what was is like a small closet space there, open space. So, you know, he was lower, he got down, I had his, um, his bulletproof vest holding on to it and we were like, okay, let's go check around the corner. We push around the corner and it's a water bed. Like we start rolling across the bed. And at that point I was just like, get me out of this house. I am done with this. So we clear that house and um, so we get up, we exit, we, we go out the house and immediately other officers, I remember Glenn Holcomb was the first one I saw and he was a guy I grew up with. He's kind of like a, he was an older brother kind of figure to me. He comes running up, grabs me, hey, you're good, you're good, takes me out to the car, puts me in the car. And I remember uh, Gary was talking about his calling his <clears throat> wife and his parents, and I remember that. I was, wasn't married at the time, but my mom, uh, I called my, my stepdad, who was a fighter pilot for the Navy. And um, I called my mom, I sit in the back of a scout car, I called my mom, she answered, I said, hey, what's going on? Uh, can I talk to Bob? Yeah, here he is. And I told Bob, I said, don't let mom watch the news tonight. And he's like, why? I told him, I said, man, we've just been involved in the shooting. I know I'm gonna be on the news. Don't let, don't let my mom watch it. So um, that, that was like a big deal to me too. I was like, you know, I just didn't want her to see that. So um, anyways, we were taken down, we did, um, you know, Gary interviewed me at the homicide office. It was done like within hours, within probably an hour. Uh, I actually, I remember scuffing my shin when I stepped off the porch, I like raked my shin. So they made me go to the hospital, went to the hospital, got released, then went to the homicide detective office. Uh, met with Gary, did the interview. And like I said, at that time, you were able to tell, um, you gave your account and did the interview and then came back like a week later or days later to make sure you know everything was good. And that was one of the big changes that we saw from then to now of the 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, I, and I, as Gary was telling his story, a lot of those things come up. You know, I remember sitting on the couch that night still trying to figure out what happened. Uh, I remember getting a call from one of the other team members, and he's like, oh, man, we got all kinds of stuff. And I, I was really kind of worried. I was like, man, I hope we get something out of this house because, you know, there were a, lot of the, a lot of the warrants we ran, especially on the east side, we get very minimal amounts out of the house. Um, but I remember trying to piece it all together. So, you know, I think <clears throat> creating this company, um, I have a, a pretty – you know, valuable 
uh, lesson learned, especially through the civil lawsuit part, uh, to be able to recognize, you know, what this company is, what it means, and what it does, you know, for other people and for our members. So that's my story.